Just after 10 a.m. Eastern today, the Supreme Court ruled in the Hobby Lobby case that when it comes to access to contraception, a company like Hobby Lobby can cite its religious beliefs as a reason to not follow part of a law and to therefore deny their employees insurance coverage for contraception, coverage that those employees would otherwise have. Shortly after the ruling, an employee of Hobby Lobby sent us this letter, which our source tells us was distributed company-wide to all the thousands of people who work for that company. Dear employee family, to be clear, this is not sent to the family that owns Hobby Lobby. This was a letter sent to their employees, of whom there are about 13,000. They are not all members of the Green family that owns the company, nor do they all have the same religious beliefs as the Green family. But nevertheless, uh, dear employee family, it starts, we are thrilled with today's Supreme Court decision and what it means for the protection of religious liberty in our nation. We look forward to continuing to operate our family business in accordance with our faith and principles. We are grateful to be able to continue to provide an excellent work experience for our thousands of valued employees across the country. Excellent work experience now with 100% less access to the range of contraceptive methods that you or your doctor might want to choose from to find the one that's best for you. Interesting thing about this ruling today, do you remember how uh, in, in Bush v. Gore, when the court decided Bush v. Gore, they had this weird provision in that ruling where they said this ruling only applies to this specific case. This ruling, Bush v. Gore, it cannot be a precedent for anything else. It only applies to this one presidential election in which we choose George W. Bush to be president. Well, today's ruling says that it also only applies to this one case. It says that only the issue of contraception is subject to exceptions on religious grounds. The ruling says explicitly, if a company objects on religious grounds to some other health insurance regulation, like covering blood transfusions or vaccines or something, the ruling says explicitly, there would be no religious exemption available for that. There's only religious exemptions from birth control rules. How does that make sense? Joining us now is the person to whom we turn when things like this don't make sense to me, Dahlia Lithwick, senior editor at Slate.com. Dahlia, thanks very much for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. So um, the court's majority opinion today insists that this is a narrow ruling that you can only get a religious exemption specifically from laws about contraception. Do I understand that right and does that make sense? Uh, it's certainly asserted uh, in the majority opinion that is penned by Samuel Alito. He says all this other bad stuff that Ruth Bader Ginsburg in her dissent really kind of unspools the parade of horribles, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses and blood transfusions and Scientologists and mental health care. And he says none of that is going to happen because it's not going to happen. And so uh, it's, it's a little bit strange uh, reading the opinion. You wait for him to explain some legal principle or rule that both cabins this to closely held corporations, you know, small family corporations like the Greens, and that cabins it to contraception. And it, it's not there. Mm. It's just kind of, we, we really feel good about this one. And, and that's a little worrisome to the dissent. And to that, to that point, I guess, they're saying it doesn't apply to drug blood transfusions or mental health care or vaccines or any other thing. There's also the issue about whether it applies more widely to contraception. I mean, if you've got a family-held corporation with devoutly Roman Catholic family members running it, and they are opposed not just to contraception that they believe is abortion, but they are opposed to all contraception, doesn't this ruling essentially open the door that they can, they, they can establish that as the rule for their employees' health insurance? It's something that Ginsburg expressly says in dissent. She says, at oral argument, the Green family was asked, does your argument change if it's not just four of the 20 types of contraception, if it's all of them? And the answer is no, the argument doesn't change. And there are cases in the pipeline of employers who want to say no contraception. So I don't think this can be limited to just Ella and Plan B and IUDs. I think that there are equally strong deeply, deeply felt objections by some employers uh, in closely held corporations that are for profits that are going to come forward and say zero, zero of the 20 are okay with us. And the court is going to have to contend with it. I don't see how they get around that. And then all of a sudden there's going to be a lot of pressure on the issue of things beyond contraception that would be the same type of objection. Uh, let, me, let me just also ask you about the, the court's suggested fix. I laughed out loud uh, when I first heard um, Pete Williams explain the court's suggested fix on this, which is that the government 
should just pay directly for these objectionable methods of contraception, which some people in certain religious traditions believe are abortion. That's the fix to this. The government pays directly and takes it essentially out of the employer health insurance system. Not like there's any controversy around the government paying for things that people consider to be abortion, right? I mean, it, how feasible is the court's suggested fix here? Well, given that we have the Hyde Amendment and then the Hyde Amendment plus and then plus, 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 I mean, we've had to promise a thousand times that uh, the government, you know, is going to promise and promise and promise not to get involved in the abortion business. It's amazing to think they're simply going to say, but we will pay for everything that Hobby Lobby refuses to pay for. But the other thing that's interesting in the Ginsburg dissent is she says, really, this is a fix that any time an employer doesn't want to pay for something, the taxpayer subsidizes it? What if an employer doesn't want to give uh, a woman equal pay to a man? Does that become the taxpayer's problem? It's, it's the opposite of a fix. It's a way of shifting burdens that really terrifies the dissent. This is the kind of ruling where you look at the dissent and you think, oh yeah, this is definitely going to get overturned on appeal. And then you realize, <laughs> oh god, there's no appeal. <laughs> Dahlia Lithwick, senior editor for Slate, thank you for helping us understand this. I really appreciate it, Dahlia. Thanks. Thanks.